And now I'll say that we will be continuing our sermon series in the Westminster Shorter Catechism. We're doing question 17 today. So we'll be uh, going over that in a moment. But first, I want to, in introducing the question that we're doing today, I want to begin with a description. And tell me if this sounds familiar to you these things. A salesman tries to get away with selling a defective product. A woman calls her friend to complain about her husband and run him down. A child curses his mother. Another child goes out to play when he knows he has not completed the work that his mother gave him to do first. A worshiper vibrantly sings before the Lord in public worship with a cold and detached heart. A young man allows himself to be carried away with lustful thoughts. A young woman finds pleasure in the attention that she gets from immodest dress and immodest behavior. A man becomes embittered toward his wife and treats her with severity and harshness. An old woman gives herself over to bitterness and complaining. A minister denies God's truth in order to please men. Does that sound familiar? Does that not describe our world? We live in a world that is full of sin. Paul said, Romans 3, 23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. He also told us that there were none righteous, no, not one. Solomon said, Ecclesiastes 9, 3, Truly, the hearts of the sons of men are full of evil. Madness is in their hearts while they live, and after that, they go to the dead. And what about these things? Do these things not also sound all too familiar? A devastating storm passes through a city, destroying property and even taking lives. A young child is struck by a car and crippled for life. Another child is diagnosed with leukemia and has to undergo chemotherapy only to die in the end. A family goes out of town only to return and find that their washer hose leaked while they were gone and flooded out their whole house. A whole nation is devastated by starvation and one by one people drop off, most of them into an eternity without Christ. A virus infects the world, taking lives, filling hearts with fear so that businesses are ruined, schools are closed, people are isolated, and churches are unable to assemble. A young man buys a computer for university, and it gives him nothing but trouble. A farmer diligently plants and tends his crops only to have them destroyed by a drought. A bride slips in the mud on her way to the, into the church as the music begins to play for her to make her entrance. A busy mother works hard to prepare a special meal for her husband's manager, only to have it burn because the regulator on the oven is broken. A kind man has a stroke, dies in a hospital bed, and spends eternity in hell. Scripture also testifies not only of sin, but also of the misery in the world. Job said, Job 14, 1, Man who is born of woman is of few days and full of trouble. Moses said, For all our days we have passed away in your wrath. We finish our years like a sigh. Does all that I have said not accurately describe the condition of the world? Certainly, there are better things that can be seen in the world and said about the world. We can find many noble and kind deeds that are done. We can find glory and happiness in the world. Like Paul in Acts 14, we can truly say of God, He, God, did not leave himself without witness in that he did good, gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. But even so, Paul presents even this goodness that he has described not to flatter his hearers into supposing that all is well with them, but rather to call them to repentance, 
before the judgment of God overtakes them at the last day. Satan can take, take Jesus up on a high mountain and he can show him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. There is much beauty and there is much to be admired. But Jesus did not want these kingdoms as they were because he knew that what was beneath the show of glory. Satan showed him the palaces, but Jesus saw the unhappiness and the strife and division within those magnificent dwellings. He also saw the houses of poverty that Satan did not show him. Satan showed him the healthy and the vibrant, but Jesus also saw the sick and the dying. Satan showed him the harmony and peace, but Jesus also saw the hatred and all the war. Jesus did not want the kingdoms of this world as they were. That's what Satan tempted him to have. But he only wanted the world as redeemed as it would be redeemed by him in his saving work on the cross. Truly, the world without redemption is a sinful, perishing world, not a place that anyone would want to be forever. It is a world of sin and misery. That's what question 17 tells us is the result of the fall of man. Let's recite this question together. This is the catechism question that we're looking at today. Question 17. Question 17. Into what estate did the fall bring mankind? The fall brought mankind into an estate of sin and misery. As a general rule, people in our society do not like to acknowledge that we live in a world of sin and misery. We all like to think positively and hope the best and just try to do the best that we can with things as they are. But the truth is, no one but Jesus is free from sin and everyone, including Jesus, must taste the misery of this fallen world. Mankind fell into an estate of sin and misery. That is the reason. In previous questions in the Catechism, we have seen that the Bible teaches us how this state of affairs came about. In question 10, we saw that God did not create us this way. God was not the author of all of this. God created us male and female after his own image in knowledge, righteousness, and holiness with dominion over the creatures. This is brought out clearly in Genesis 1, 26 through 28. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them, and God, God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Now, remember a couple of things here. Now, this is all by way of review as we consider that God did not make the world this way. This is what we saw back in question 10. Remember a couple of things that are brought out in this passage from Genesis 1, 26 through 28. His image means that we were made to perfectly reflect his glory. God continually supplied us with wisdom and grace for beautiful and holy living. We were beautiful replicas of him, both corporately and individually. There was no sin in us at creation. And with dominion, it means that the whole creation did what we wanted it to do. We had dominion over it. There were no storms or diseases or death or famine. No misery. When you planted a crop, that was the crop that came up instead of weeds that you didn't plant. So you see then that it was not that God created us in a state of sin and misery. We have also seen in our catechism study how Adam and Eve fell from the estate in which they were created. Question 13 tells us that it was by sinning against God, an act for which they were wholly responsible. God gave Adam and Eve a way to clearly and definitively state that they no longer wished to live under his rule, to have God as their God. And they had all they had to do to officially declare their rebellion was to eat the forbidden fruit. 
Question 15 tells us that that is exactly what they did. This is how they fell. It was a wretched, sinful choice. By this sin, they put themselves away from the blessing of God and so brought themselves into an estate of sin and misery. Last week, I showed you with question 16 how their act of rebellion was not just an act for themselves, but an act for all of us. We are one family. There is a solidarity between us and Adam as our father. Adam was like the trunk of a, of a tree we saw, of a, the human tree that was rooted to God. And we are like the branches that would grow out of that trunk. Adam was cut off. And so all of we, we were all cut off with him as the branches of that tree. When he ate the forbidden fruit, we all were cast into a state of sin and misery with him. That is why things are as they are in the world. That's why there is so much sin and so much misery all around us. This week, we will begin to examine this estate into which we fell. Our scripture reading is from Genesis 3, 9 through 19. So this is our reading that we will have particularly in connection with question 17. Genesis 3, beginning in verse 9. Here is the word of God. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? Then the man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle, and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Then to Adam he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you are taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. And may the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his holy word. In this reading, we see that God sentenced us to the estate of sin and misery in which we are now are. It is not just the way things are that there is sin and misery. The present estate of sin and misery is God's judicial sentence that we experience. A lot of people want to attribute the storms to something impersonal like Mother Nature or to impersonal weather forces and also try to deny human sin, at least until it hurts them. They will talk about the goodness of man until someone does wrong to them and then they're ready to condemn. And even then, they will attribute sin to biological or social issues such as the survival instinct or mental disorder or something along those lines. Others who are a little more religious will say that God does not send troubles, but simply allows Satan and man to do things that are hurtful in the world. This is just another way of denying the Bible's plain teaching that we are in a state of, in the estate of sin and misery because of God's curse for rejecting him. It's a way of trying to deny that. It is true that Satan and man are agents that bring many troubles into the world, but these troubles are still all expressions of God's curse upon the world. Either form of denial is very wicked and is a form of rebellion itself. Here we are being punished by God and we act like God has nothing to do with it. I suppose this is because we don't want to entertain the thought that one so mighty 
is displeased with us. That's an uncomfortable position to be in, to have God Almighty displeased with you. But it's really very wicked to deny it. It's even though it is often an effort to protect God's reputation that we flatter ourselves that we're engaging in when we deny that what we see is the result of God's wrath and curse. The problem is that we have a very twisted view of what constitutes good. It is not a defect in God for him to punish us for rejecting him. It is beautiful and glorious. It is a beautiful and glorious thing that God hates sin. Let's take a closer look at how Genesis 3 describes God's sentencing of us to an estate of sin and misery. First, see how God told the woman that she would have trouble with fruitfulness or reproduction in verse 16 because of what she had done. Yes, she would still be able to bring forth children. That was a great mercy. But it would be done with much affliction and sorrow. How much sorrow there is in the simple fact that we bring forth children that are subject to death. Many of them die in the early stages of development before they are even born. And many others die right at birth. And if not that, then they are subject to sickness and injury. And finally to death and old age. We bring them into the world with only one sure prospect, that the day will come when they die. It is wrong to just accept that this is just the way it is. It is God's judgment, and it ought to make us sad and broken. Not angry, but sad and broken because we displease God. We ought to mourn over our fallen condition. But sickness and death, or misery, is not all. Besides death and sickness, there is the difficulty in training up children, the problem of sin. Part of the sorrow of bringing forth children is in the rebellion of those children against us and their strife with one another. Even for parents who don't care if their children worship God, there are the struggles of drug abuse or general rebellion and of contention in the home. And there are the struggles of laziness and wastefulness that leads to poverty and often burden parents with the care of their children when they should be old enough to care for themselves. Many parents have their hearts broken by the rebellion of their children, the way Adam and Eve did when Cain rose up and murdered his brother Abel. And then there, are, there is the difficulty of family structure. We have trouble living in the arrangement that God established where we're tied to each other in relationships of subordination and authority. It's something beautiful when it's done in God's way, when it's done well. It's something perverse and distorted when not. This is brought out at the end of verse 16 where the woman is told, you de- your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. She will want to have, she will want to have her husband. She will want to have a husband. She'll want him to be what she wants him to be, but instead he will rule over her. It is exactly the same construction that is used of sin in Genesis 4-7, where God tells Cain, sin lies at the door and its desire is for you. It wants to have, it wants to dominate you, but you should rule over it. You should master it. In other words, Genesis 3-16 could be translated, your desire shall be to master your husband but he will dominate you. Not dominate in the sense of govern and care for, but control, so that she will want to escape. Surely we see this in the extreme today. Those, they, they, they are unhappy, women are unhappy with their husbands, with men, but then they are unhappy when they try to do without them as well. They want to ignore them, but then they always seem to end up living in response to them. They want to abandon their own calling and take their husband's place. They reject the call to bear children, which is a woman's glory, and seek to, do, and seek to go out in the world and master the world. Titus 2, 4 through 5 instructs the older women to admonish the young women to love their husbands and to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, homemakers, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. Not that every woman must marry or will be able to marry, but that this is their ordinary calling and something that they desire, yet something they hate at the same time. 
They desire to be with men, and yet they hate it at the same time. Moreover, the woman is told here that she will be uneasy and distrustful of her husband's leadership and will always be wanting to master him. This speaks of many things. It speaks of the woman's now natural rebellion against authority and everyone else's rebellion against whatever authority is over them as well. There is a tendency always to chafe and to want to go our own way. It speaks of the husband's incompetence in ruling his home that makes his wife uneasy and restless so that she wants to take over. It speaks of the husband's selfishness and failure to consider the best interests of his family. Just look at all the men today that even utterly abandon their wife and children and leave them to themselves. It speaks of men who violate women in order to fill their lusts without taking responsibility to care for them and love them. It speaks of tensions between husband and wife that destroy the harmony and the sweetness of their marriage and their home. It speaks of the breakdown in all of society in relationships of authority and subordination, in marriage, in parenting, in business, in government, in church government, and on and on the list goes. It is truly a great plight upon the world. All this trouble in marriage is something that God tells the woman will be brought on her because of her disobedience. The curse strikes right at the point where her calling is to be a helper to her husband and to fill the earth with children. The sentence of God to an estate of sin and misery continues also with the man and his calling. The man is told that he will have trouble subduing the earth. That is his primary calling because God cursed the ground on account of what he did. That's in verses 17 through 19. Although God curses it, he tells Adam that he will still be able to eat from it. Just like the woman who is still able to bring forth children, the man will still be able to eat food that he produces. The difference is that now it will be with great difficulty that he will produce food. He will plant a crop, but the ground will yield something else. It will yield thorns and thistles. He will have sweat and struggle to get what he needs. This speaks of all the difficulties that man has with his calling to subdue the earth. There is a struggle with drought, with disease, with flooding, with hail, with cold, with heat. There are broken tools and broken bones and sickness to contend with. How much anxiety a little thing, as little thing as a computer, can cause a man, a modern man. Technology is certainly a wonderful thing that makes our lives easier but it also brings all kinds of frustrations that we're not mature enough to handle. But above all, the curse is seen here in that the man is promised that the ground will one day swallow him up and turn him to powder and dust. The very ground that he was taken out of and given to subdue is now ground in which he is buried and in which he becomes indistinguishable from that ground. This is the ultimate humiliation of man. From dust you are taken, and to dust you shall return. That is the pronouncement of the curse of God. There was no death but for the fall of man. Don't miss that main point. All this sin and misery is from God's sentence. It is from God's hand. It's not just the way things are. God has turned us over to this condition because we rejected him as our God. It's not from natural consequences. It's not from random causes. It is God's deliberate judicial act, and we must never deny that. He has cursed us by bringing us into an estate of sin and misery because he is displeased with our rebellion. Though we may not like that, we must never deny that. We must accept the truth and live honestly before God. How should you respond to this estate of sin and misery into which the Lord has consigned us, judicially consigned us. Let's look at four ways that you should respond. First, you should, as I was just saying, affirm that our fallen condition is the result of God's judgment. We are wrongly inclined to deny this because we're uncomfortable to have our Creator displeased with us, to have Him actually turning us over to sin and misery, we would prefer to think that the sin and sorrow of this world just happened and that God has nothing to do with it. But it will do you no good to deny reality just because you don't like it. 
We have seen from Genesis 3 that God is the one who brought us into the estate of sin and misery because of our rejection of him. All through the Bible, as we saw when we looked at God's decrees, the Lord declares that he is the one who sends the storms, the wars, the sicknesses, as well as the one who removes them, and the one who turns people over to sin, hardening their heart as a punishment for their former sins. You need to deal with it, not deny it. And now the second thing, once you accept the fact that God brought us into an estate of sin and misery because we rejected him, you ought to be deeply humbled by the sin and the affliction that you see in the world. When you see sin and sorrow that is in this world, you need to say, this is what has come upon us all for rejecting our God. This is what we fully deserve and more. In a godly society, when there is a flood or a drought or a hurricane, the people in the society humble themselves and confess their sin to God. They pray to God for mercy and confess their sins to him. Daniel provides a good example of this in Daniel 9 with his prayer. That's the prayer that we looked at when COVID-19 first became uh, very apparent in our society. The people had suffered greatly in Daniel's day at the hands of their enemies. Many had died or lost loved ones, and many had been exiled, even of the people of God. But Daniel, instead of complaining, is humbled by all of this. He says, Daniel 9, 3, Then I set my face toward the Lord God to make requests by prayer and supplication with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. And I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession and said, O Lord God, great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant and mercy with those who love him and with those who keep his commandments, we have sinned and committed iniquity. We have done wickedly and rebelled even by departing from your precepts and your judgments. Daniel knows that such things wouldn't have happened upon the whole nation of Israel except that they had broken covenant with God. God is the one who keeps covenant. But he says, We have sinned and committed iniquity and done wickedly and rebelled, even in departing from your precepts and judgments. Verse 6, Neither have we heeded your servants the prophets who spoke in your name to our kings and our princes, to our fathers and all the people of the land. They had been warned, they had been urged to turn back to God and to heed him, but they did not listen to the sermons that they heard. O Lord, he says, righteousness belongs to you, but to us shame of face as it is this day. To the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and of all Israel, those near and those far off in all the countries to which you have driven them, because of the self because of the unfaithfulness which they have committed against you. O Lord, to us belongs shame of face, to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, because we have sinned against you. To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against him. How different this is from the way people respond today. Some swell out their little chests and boast that, We will overcome this because we are so strong. We have seen too much of this with coronavirus. Some get angry with God and curse him for these troubles. Some question and say, why has this happened to us? It should be obvious to us when we are so wicked as we are. Still others take a sweet approach and deny that God has anything to do with it. But yet, He has everything to do with it. Be humbled. It is because of our sin. Now, Please understand what I'm saying here. I am not saying that every affliction that you experience is a direct punishment for some particular sin that you have committed. But I am saying that all affliction should humble us because it reminds us that the whole human race has rejected God and that we are partakers in the sin of the human race. And every affliction is a reminder to us of our sin. The struggles we have with our own sin and our afflictions in this world have a way of of bringing us more in touch with the demerit of our sin when we look at them honestly. They testify of what we brought on by rejecting God. When God's Spirit works in us so that we can look at them as we should, then we see the true nature of these afflictions and of our sin. 
and they help us to identify both sin and misery, helps us to identify a little more with what we actually deserve. Punishment in hell forever. What we have here is only a small taste. Suffering helps us not to be aloof about suffering. We taste it, we experience it, and we gain more sense of what our Lord even had to endure for us when he bore our iniquities. The more you suffer, the more you can relate to his sufferings, and the more humble you become. If indeed you receive it all from God, instead of becoming angry with him or accusing him of injustice or denying that he sent it at all. And so being humbled, now let's look at the third appropriate response to this estate of sin and misery. When you feel the condition of, this, of sin and misery in your own life, repent, cry out for deliverance and rest in Christ your Savior. Surely you see the sin that is in your life. Even the Apostle Paul, as godly as a man as he was, confessed that sin was all too present with him, that he was way too much, that it was way too much a part of his life. He found it present even as he sought to live for the Lord. And so he cried out, saying, Romans 7, 24, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? And then with jubilation he answered his own question, Romans 7, 25, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. He knew that deliverance was in the Lord. There is no other way to be forgiven and delivered from sin than through Jesus Christ. Don't deny your sinful estate because then you can't face it fully and turn to Jesus Christ. He did not die on the cross for naught. He died in, that we might be forgiven, that we might be delivered from our sin. But you must come to him, looking to him in faith, or you will not be delivered. Don't you see how much you need him? You are, you are of the human race, and we have all rejected God. The sin in us is a mark of this great sin. Cry out for deliverance. And likewise, as you experience the sufferings of this world, don't get angry. Recognize that it is a small taste of what we deserve. Let the reality of God's pleasure, displeasure sink into your soul. Realize that John the Baptist was right when he told us to flee from the wrath to come. Suffering drives some people away from God, but it drives the elect to God for mercy. As Psalm 38 begins, O Lord, do not rebuke me in your wrath, nor chasten me in your hot displeasure. For your arrows pierce me deeply, and your hand presses me down. And then at Psalm 15, the psalmist expresses his assurance that God will deliver him. For in you, O Lord, I hope. You will hear, O Lord, my God. I'm sorry, in verse 15, 38, 15. For, for in you, O Lord, I hope. You, you will hear, O Lord, my God. Yes, indeed, we have a Savior who has redeemed us. Our worship is so different than pagan worship, where the worshipers must appease their gods by their sacrifices. In our worship, we rest in what he has provided for our salvation, knowing that it is sufficient and that it is accepted by him. You think of the different flood stories that we hear some of the flood stories by the pagans that were written later after the flood, they reflecting back on the, the flood and how it happened. And it was because the people were not offering the gods enough sacrifice and the gods were hungry. And so they decided to send the flood. In the true flood story, it's because of the wickedness of man and that man needs to repent. The means of grace are not meant to appease God. When we come to worship God and we use the means of grace, we're not coming to the Lord's Supper or getting baptized or hearing the word or praying or all of those things in order to appease God by doing those things. Rather, we're coming to receive the assurance of the forgiveness that he has provided to us in Christ. All the means of grace teach us to look to Christ our Savior and to the working of his spirit in us, to the working of God and the grace of God and the promise of God. They do not teach us that we do these things in order that God will accept us. No, we do them because by promise he receives us. He gives us grace in his mercy and covenant. And now we come to the fourth way that you should respond as you experience the estate of sin and misery. Fourthly, you should respond to sin and affliction with gratitude. You will say, with gratitude? Yes, indeed, with gratitude. First, 
Give thanks for the affliction because of the good that it does for you. Psalm 119 speaks of how we learn of God and his statutes through affliction, that before I was afflicted, I went astray. And in Romans 5, we're told how affliction teaches us patience or perseverance in serving God and how perseverance brings about proven character and how proven character brings about hope and how hope does not disappoint because the love of God is poured out by the Spirit of God into our hearts so that we learn to love God. We learn to love God and we learn of the love of God, both of those things. And we we have also seen today how affliction helps us to humble us and get us to cry out to God. It does good. We have reason to give thanks. Secondly, give thanks for sin and affliction because it is so mild in comparison with what we deserve. We deserve to burn in hell right now and to be turned over right now to total corruption, to be abandoned, to go on our own wretched sinful way. Instead, God has given us this world where we only have a taste of the punishment for a time, the punishment that we really deserve, where our sin is greatly restrained and held back. What would we be like without that restraint? It would be horrifying to know. Be thankful that things are not a whole lot worse than they are, that God has given us time in this world when his judgment is comparatively light. See God's goodness in the worst trials because... They could be much worse. Something as bad is burning in hell. You see, whatever we have here is nothing in comparison to that. And thirdly, give thanks that your afflictions are mixed with many mercies. We can see this in the curse that God promised to Adam and Eve. There were the, mis- the, there were the mercies of common grace. Though there is sorrow in bearing children, we saw that the woman can still bear children. And there are many joys with that. Though we have trouble in our work with ground that has been cursed, we're still able to grow food, wonderful food, and to make things and to be productive. Rejoice in whatever mercy is mixed with your trials. Did the power go off? Give thanks that it came back on. Did your teeth get bashed in? Give thanks that they didn't get bashed out. Did you wreck on your motorcycle? Rejoice that you're still alive. But even more, you should give thanks for the mercies of redemption. When we see our sin and our affliction, how thankful we should be that God sent his son to deliver us from it all. Thank him for sending his son to die for us. Thank him for sending the Holy Spirit to change us. Thank him for promising salvation to us when we come to Christ. And of course, do indeed come to him. Yes, the world is a hard place, but our gracious God has provided deliverance for us in his son. Receive it and give thanks to him. So to summarize, we have seen that all sin and misery in this world is a result of God's judgment. Judgment that we fully deserve for rejecting him as our God when the human family began. In response to the reality that we are in a state of sin and misery, you ought to stop denying that this estate is from God. To be humbled as you find yourself in this estate of sin and misery. To repent and seek God's forgiveness and mercy from this sin and misery in Christ. To give thanks for the affliction, for the good that it brings that it is not worse than it is, and that there are mercies that are mixed with it. Indeed, how glad we should be for our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who came in the world in order to bear our sin and misery for us. Not that he sinned, but he bore the punishment and the consequences of our sin, even the shame of our sin as our representative. He took all of our sins, responsibility for all of our sins, And he went to the cross in order to redeem us. We'll be looking at this much more in future catechism studies. But first, we're going to spend a couple more weeks looking at this condition of sin and misery that we are in now. Please stand and let's call on the name of the Lord. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you now in prayer, acknowledging that you are holy and just 
that you are righteous in all of your judgments and that in sending the afflictions that we have in this world, that you have done nothing but what is just and holy. Father, that we fully deserve much worse than what we have experienced here. There is so much restraint on us that you have not turned us over to completely to our own way. You have given us many things that keep us from going so far away. We thank you too, Lord, that you have mediated your mercies, that they are, or, or your, uh, your judgments in the affliction that we have, that, that there is still much mercy that's mixed with them and that they're not nearly as severe as they will be and as they might be. Father, we pray that you would, you would help us, Lord, to respond to you during these days in this life while we still have opportunity to come and receive your redemptive mercy. Father, what great grace there is that, that for such sinners as we are, that you should have provided your Son to, to come and bear your wrath and curse for us, that he might bear our shame and our guilt and our suffering in order that we might be fully pardoned through him. We pray, Lord, that we would come to our Lord Jesus Christ and that we would rejoice in him and that we would go forth with gratitude, praising his name. Lord, how good you have been to us, how kind you have been to us. Help us to encourage one another to, to turn to Jesus Christ and to live in him and not to become overwhelmed or discouraged in this world of sin and misery. Father, we thank you for the hope that we have and the promises that are ours in Christ Jesus. We ask your blessing now in his glorious name. Amen.